Well, what you know, I grew up Baptist, all right? It wasn't any fault of my own. My parents, uh, my parents went to that church. Uh, you know, my mom, I think she grew up a Presbyterian, and she's very Baptist, and so she had to go to Baptist church. And uh, so we grew up Baptist, and in this Baptist church, uh, we were taught wrongly that our salvation was really dependent on our ability to be good. Okay? Um, in, in essence, uh, salvation in our church was a matter of uh, scaring us into wanting to be saved. Alright? I mean, our pastor was great at painting these images of flame and fire and molten lava. And, you know, if we weren't good, God was going to get us. And so what it basically turned into is God is the big guy in the sky with a hammer and I'm the nail. Alright? And anytime I would do anything bad, BAM! He was right there and knock me. To really kind of put me out of my misery. And so I live in fear. I mean, I think everybody in our youth group got saved at least a hundred times. <laughs> okay? Because we have this basic understanding that God only loved us if we were good. And if we got out of line, God stopped loving us, and He was going to damn us for eternity to hell. And so we were just driven to, you know, like, Oh, okay, then there. Now be saved again. Okay, I'm there. And there from week to week to week, it was just a matter of fear. I don't think that's what God teaches in the Bible. And I'm glad to say that we can experience security in our relationship with God. Jesus teaches us. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we talk about what it means to remain, how do we remain, I'm going to talk just briefly about what the results of remaining in Jesus are. Because I think we get mixed up about two different things. We, we start thinking that the results of remaining are the things that keep us secure. When in reality, they're just the presence of the reality of the fact that we are secure in Christ. They're the results of remaining in Christ, okay? The first one is this. The first one, it says, we are faithful to Jesus' teachings. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. Now, it sounds like a conditional statement. It's not a conditional statement. It's just a fact. If you are remaining with me, you are going to obey my teaching. That's going to be a natural response, a natural outgrowth of remaining in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're going to be obedient. It's going to happen. All right? But John Piper says this. He says, the transaction with Jesus in the past that has no ongoing expression in our lives is basically a false transaction. When Jesus said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, he meant that if we don't abide, we're not truly his disciples. Now, it can sound like, oh, okay, so my security is dependent upon my obedience. It, it's not true. The truth is, when you abide, there's going to be this natural response of obedience. Okay? Don't get mixed up. Now the second thing that is a result of remaining in Jesus is that we produce much fruit. In John 15, it says this, I am the true vine, the grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. Now, I, I didn't notice this before. I'm telling you, you really start studying. You look at verse 3, it says this. Interesting. He's talking to his disciples, and he says this. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I gave you. Now, I was raised to believe that, oh, this is what you think about something he's going to do all the time, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it's a possibility that if you're not good, he's going to touch you completely off. He's going to throw you in the Whoa! So, again, I was petrified, and I was forced to believe that unless I was obedient, I was I was good. Okay? And this says just the opposite. It says, you won't even prove. You see, the pruning for a believer happens at the moment you put your trust and faith in Jesus. When you say, yes, I believe that Jesus died for my sin, you've been pruned. All of the bad stuff, all of the sin is cut away. It's 
gone. It's thrown into the fire. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. So at that moment that you trust Jesus that he's forgiven of your sin, you're pruned. And what does it say? You've been pruned and purified. It's a done deal. Okay? It's a done deal. So then he says, remain in me, and I'll remain in you. Again, it's not a conditional statement. It's a statement of fact. You've been through all your sin has been taken away forever. You are purified. Now just stick. Just keep believing that. Alright? So, now let's fast forward. He says, now remain in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love. Just that I obey my Father's commands and remain in His love. He says, I told you these things so that you will be filled with what? Fear? No. So you'll be filled with joy, the Bible says. So the idea here is Jesus is trying to impress upon his followers the fact that your sins have been forgiven, you are secure in your relationship with him. Just stick there. Just stay there with your brain. Remember, you, you have been forgiven. Now, the natural result is going to be remaining in his love. Just to sit and soak in it. All right? That's the idea here. He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I love you. You're my friends. If you do what I command, he says. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confine you a slave. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything my father told me to tell you. Verse 16 says this. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Get strength in your brain. Your salvation was not initiated by you. God chose you. He created you, and he said, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can because I love you people. I'm going to do everything I can to stay in communication with them, to stay in relationship with them. And when sin entered the world and it destroyed that, that relationship, God said, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. Because I love them so much. So I'm going to take you and form them and go around and I'm going to make sure their sins are covered and paid for once and for all. And they're going to be secure. That's how much my love He initiated it. And he said, I'm choosing you. Right? You don't choose Jesus. Jesus chooses you. And then all you do is say, okay, I'm in. Thank you. Thank you for choosing me. Right? Like that's salvation. He chooses you. And you say, okay, cool. I'm in. Thank you. That's it. Now, he says, I am one of you. Now, to go and produce lasting fruit. So the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And this is my command. What you say? Love one another. So what is lasting fruit? So you know, when I grew up in my church, lasting fruit was simply, you know, you've got to save people. You know, fruit are people, right? So when you say something, poof, you become a fruit, right? And uh, it's like, you know, that's not it at all. I mean, again, I was, it meant only I had the new baby Christ. I have to share my faith today. Uh-oh, I'm not producing fruit. You know, I better go take tracks and put them in telephone booths, you know, you know telephone booths are, you know, telephone booths are. Wow, I'm dating myself, all right? <laughs> yeah, but we used to be giving tracks and it's like, you know, quick and talk to somebody, so you just take one of those telephone booths, you know, you put it on a chair and everywhere. We go to, you know, go to the beach and we're going to go to the beach and we're going to get enough tracks for people to say them. And, you know, you're like, how many did you say, oh, okay, well, you produce fruit. You know, that's not producing fruit at all. You know what producing fruit is? It's simple. Loving people. Love people as much as God has loved you. But the question is, are you more loving today than you were yesterday? Right? Do you have a kind of spirit that's growing? Do you, what does God want from you? He wants you to love people. Jesus said, all the commands, all the prophets, all the writings of the scriptures, can boil, can boil down to two things. Love God and love people. So you know what fruit it is? It's loving people more and more and more. Simple. Say, so, oh, okay, so God wants me to love people. You know what? Ooh, I got this little brother. Man, he's rough. He's crazy. You just say, God, give me love for this guy. Help him not kill him. That's the first step of love. <laughs> Help me love my boss more. He's taking so much. Okay, God. So 
with your will, help me to love the Lord. Help me to love my spouse more. They're not loving me back, it feels like. It doesn't feel very good in our back in our house. Implant in me a deep love for them. You know what? Jesus loved us when we were unlovely. He loved us when we were covered in sin. <coughs> Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what to do. So I've kind of adopted that. I say, okay, as a Christian, what I have to do sometimes is just say, okay, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. Now, you don't say that out loud when they're there, all right? Okay? Because then yeah, that could be bad. But just say, okay, God, they, they don't get it. They hurt me. They're, they're still hurting me. But Father, forgive me. And give me the capacity to be forgiven. Give me the capacity to love like you love. To just set it out there and say, okay, you know, my kid is just crazy. He's not, he's not responding to my love. How can you keep loving and never stop? That's true. That's the proof. And so as a Christian, what can we see as our, as our love continues to grow for the unlovely, those who are hard to love, that's fruit in your life. And so that's it. Yeah. That's going to be a result of fruit. Now why? How, how can we have that result of fruit? Well, it's, it's pretty easy. Because we've been loved. And so, in essence, fruit is what? It's love. That is going to grow more and more and more. Now, unfortunately, we tend to put the confidence of our salvation in our ability to love others. If, if we're not producing fruit, then we feel like we're not really safe. But the truth is, remaining in Jesus produces that. And so we have to convince ourselves, we have to believe in our heart of hearts that we truly are forgiven, that we truly are loved. So how do we remain in Jesus? Okay, now we're coming to you. Uh, it's not by obeying Jesus' commands, and it's not focusing on bearing the fruit of love. That's not how you remain in Jesus. Obedience and bearing fruit is a result of remaining in Jesus. So, how do you remain in Jesus? Here it is. Remaining in Jesus simply means this. It means trusting His teaching about how much God loves you. It means continuing to believe moment by moment that you're loved, that you've been given eternal life, and you're never ever going to perish. It means believing that no one and nothing can ever take you away from Jesus. No one's going to be able to snatch you away from Jesus. Period. Now, if you don't believe that, okay, we've got to go to some other scriptures. Again, Jesus is talking. I love this scripture. It's in John chapter 10. It says, My sheep listen to me. I know them, and they follow me. Here it is. I don't know if you don't, and you don't have an underline yet. I give them eternal I give them eternal life. They don't earn it. I give it to them, Jesus says. And they will what? Say it out loud. Never perish. Jesus said, I'm the one who gives eternal life. And if I give it to them, they're never going to perish. He says, no one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. I love that. This is Jesus saying, my dad is bigger than your dad. I mean, nobody is tougher than Jesus' dad. And he's got this. No one is getting it. My dad is so strong. Okay? He had polio. And so his legs were kind of withered and stuff. And he had trouble walking. But from here up, he was like Charles Bass. And God, he had a grip. If you ever shook his hand, you better be ready. It's by His great mercy to 
we've been born again, it, it, it's him and his action, not us. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now here's the important part. Now we live with what? Great fear? No. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, what is faith is just believing and trusting, God is protecting you by His power until you receive the salvation. This is better off Christianity, folks. Satan wants you to believe that your salvation is dependent upon your performance. Okay? It's not. It's dependent upon Jesus' performance on the cross. He died to pay the penalty of sin. It is gone. It is gone. Past, present, and future. And your salvation is secure. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Believing is trusting in the truth of what Jesus said. And Jesus said, if he initiated your salvation, he says, I'm the one who started this thing. I'm the one who wanted you in my family. I'm the one who paid the penalty for your sin. You are forgiven. And if you say yes and just believe it, you're secure. God gives you to me, and no one is going to be able to take you away. No one, no one, no one. I want you to know I have trouble believing you. Sometimes. I have trouble when I mess something. When I do something wrong. When I'm not very well. Same thing that I'm going to see there. You know, because you're not obedient, because you're not loving, you must not be. Say, so, you know what? You know, when I do that stuff, you know what? God's forgiven me that. While I was still a sinner, Jesus died for me. You, you, you wiped the slate clean. And now I have to, when I sin, what I confess. You want the word confess me to me, agree with God. Say the same thing about your sin you commit as God said. What did God say was wrong? So when I do something wrong, instead of, you know, getting insecure, I, I say what God said about that sin. He said, yeah, that was wrong. But he also says, you know what? It's forgiven. This is why Paul in the New Testament he says, so do I what? Sin more, so grace and about more? He says, no, no, no. But he says, get the picture. When I sin, it actually reminds me that I'm forgiven. So when that sin happens, you go, oh, how can I do something so out of character with the person that I am? So Paul says, it's because they're still attached to this old body. And as soon as this body is dead and gone, God's going to renew us in a way that we're not attached to this sinful body anymore. We're not going to struggle with that issue. But until then, we're supposed to say the same thing about something God said. And God said, you know what? That sin is wrong. What you did is wrong. But it's forgiven. And with my help, you can overcome that. And you can be a loving, caring, compassionate, forgiving person. Instead of being spirited and condemning and judgmental and want revenge. God says, you can be a loving person that I always believe for you to be. You know how you do that? You start rejoicing in the fact that you're forgiven. You start rejoicing in the fact that you are completely secure in God's love. And when you finally get to that point where you believe, you trust Him, in verse 8 of uh, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, it says this, you love Him even though you have never seen Him, though you do not see Him now. You what? You trust Him. Trust Him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. This is why you see a Christian and walk around with a dumb smile on his face. Right? You know why? It's because he gets it. Even though I'm a schlub some days, God keeps loving you. Isn't that great? Yeah. That is so awesome. To know that in spite of my failures, in spite of my sin, periodically, God keeps on a never, ever heard of stuff. And you know what? The world, and sometimes the church, is not very good at expressing this kind of love. We, we get too condemning, we get too judgmental. And what the church is meant to be is a place where we express to one another God's continual 
love and forgiveness. You still want to be on this track? Help me love this person. Help me remind them that they're loved. I am never going to walk away. But you know what? Some people do walk away. They say, oh, you've done that. I'm walking away from you. You do that. I'm divorcing you from my life. You're out of here. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're bad. And so we teach people inadvertently that their love is based on performance. Being loved is based on performance. The church is here to tell them that's not how it works. Okay? You're, you're going to be loved no matter what you do. I'm not going to stop. I'm never going to stop. I'm going to keep on loving you. Even if you get my face, I'm going to keep loving you no matter what. And that's the example that we have to set for one another. And so this week, you know, I want you to go to the life application because what it talks about is the next level of, 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 of temptation. And that is this. We're tempted to doubt when sometimes circumstances in our life are created either by our own stupidity or just by circumstances that happen because the world is a small place. And we, we're, we're taught to believe that our circumstances should be a blessing from God for good. And if they go south, maybe God doesn't love me anymore. Something bad happens to me. If I don't have health or, or I lose my job or somebody dies that I love, then God's removed his love from me. And then we're tempted to believe that maybe somehow we've done something wrong and we're not safe anymore because God is not loving us the way we thought he would. Okay? Go to life application is going to help you understand the circumstances. No matter what happens, God is still loving you. Okay? So, encourage one another with that. I want you to encourage you to do that. But understand this today. Love God. Just trust Him. Believe with all your heart that He loves you. That's why you trust And when you do that, there's a natural response. You're going to say, God, oh, thank so much. You forgive me so much. Yes, of course I'm going to do what you want me to do. Hello? And I'm going to love people the way that I just love. It just makes sense. Right? Cool. Let's pray. God, thank you that you do love us. Thank you that uh, you're not going to stop. Thank you that you initiated our salvation and that we just have to say yes, we believe that you love us that much. God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's someone here that is struggling with that. We pray that you would help them to feel